Hello and welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I'm your host, Ray Harkins, and we're sitting here at episode number six. I'm recording this on a lovely morning in Southern California. And uh, I appreciate all the feedback that I've been getting from people on Twitter and email as well. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, it's at 100 Words Podcast, and 100 is the number. And the email is 100 Words Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, I actually sent out Friday Night Light DVDs to a listener just because I had an extra set lying around here. So you could very well be another person that gets some random free shit from around my house. I also want to encourage people to subscribe via iTunes. So go into your iTunes, type in 100 Words Podcast, and then press the subscribe free button. And uh, you will be able to get all of the new shows that we post every Tuesday morning. And we've been pretty consistent so far. And when I say we, I mean I've been pretty consistent so far. And I'm proud of myself for that. It's sometimes not easy when you've got a busy life and work and all the other stuff that we do in between all the fun stuff that we like. So, um, yeah, subscribe, and you will get every single episode. And I promise, this kind of leads into another thought I've been having, where sometimes, and I've noticed, you know, the guests are very different from one another. Um, so, obviously, some people might be more interested in one episode versus someone from another episode but i encourage you to at least give it a try because you might learn a thing or two about you know some musician or band that you have no connection to or no idea about but they do have compelling things to say and that's kind of at the core of this where it's like i want to present to you the listener interesting content where it's like you might not have any connection whatsoever to this person uh musically personally anything. Uh, but they do provide some interesting context and connection to independent music. Um, and that's kind of what has always interested me in shows such as, you know, Mark Maron's podcast, um, The Sound of Young America, which is now called Bullseye, these larger sort of pop culture podcasts that bring in a wide variety of guests. And there are so many times where it's like I've, I've looked at a guest and I've been like, I have no idea who this person is and why should I care? Um, and I find myself trying to back off from that because that's kind of a, a gut reaction I know a lot of people have. But when you're able to kind of put those preconceived notions aside and be like, all right, I'm just going to listen to it for, you know, w for whatever reason that I feel like I need to. Um, so in summation, that's what I'm trying to do for you fine people. And I want you to listen to every episode and kind of give it a crack um, because there are, like I said, a wide variety of guests and they will be talking about things that you might not be interested in initially or they might be doing something that you have no connection to. But I promise at the core of it that will probably be something interesting, good stories, and uh, yeah, so listen to them all. And on that note, my guest for this episode is... The internet famous person, or I don't know what you would want to label him as, but I'm going to label him as that. His name slash persona is Sergeant D. Uh, he runs a website called StuffYouWillHate.com. He's also a regular contributor to a very, very awesome site called MetalSucks.com, uh, where basically they kind of, well, they don't make fun of the metal news of the day, but they, they definitely have a lot of personality mixed in with a lot of the news that comes out on a daily basis. Um, and I always find that very entertaining. So Sergeant D, just to put it in context, um, he is a person who is very unapologetic about the type of music that he personally enjoys. Um, and some of it may be very unpopular for people to like that are either of a certain age or have professed their love for a certain genre of music i.e. if you say that you are over the age of 30 and you like Blink-182, people may give you a very strange look. But um, yeah, so Sergeant D is a very larger-than-life character, um, and I thought he'd be a perfect person to have on the podcast and uh, kind of talk some stuff. So uh, we sat down over Skype one evening after he got off work, and this is what ensued. <laughs> My first exposure to you was um, 
not specifically through your site stuff you will hate because how long have you had that domain name and you've been kind of doing stuff on that um since august of 2009 i think okay and was, so. was that around the same time that you started to kind of work with and i use the word work in quotations <laughs> um that you started to uh, publish stuff on metal sucks uh yes because i used to have a blog that was about metal and i stopped doing that because i got really tired of metal fans and the guys at metal sucks said hey you know i i, I got to know them and i said hey i'm kind of like tired of doing this blog do you think i should keep doing it but it was like sort of popular and i was like do you think i should keep doing this even though my heart's not in it or should i quit doing it and uh you know like lots of bands do and they're like yeah you should quit doing it <laughs> yeah <laughs> but what, what uh was that, what was that blog uh it was called metal inquisition oh okay okay no that that that's actually where i first heard of you because uh i think a mutual friend of our well you know that dude stacy buchanan right yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, because uh, I used to work with him for years. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, because we worked at Century Media and Abacus and stuff like that. Yeah, with with all that kind of in context, I didn't know that you personally had such a uh, obviously connection to the hardcore scene. And obviously, once I started to delve into your podcast and you know hear your conversations with uh, you know luminaries in the hardcore scene, such as Todd Jones. Um, you know, it was, yeah, it just, it kind of opened up a different side of, you know, how your, the persona is of you online. Um, so, and you, what do you, what do you mean by that? The persona, yeah, the persona of you online, at least this is the way that I perceive you. And I think, um, you know, just from a general perception, um, is, you know, that you address more of the, you know, heavy music side of things, um, you know, from everything from, you know, whatever, your Amir, Acacia Strain, all that type of stuff. That's obviously, yeah you know easy to um but talk that's about. hardcore it, it it is in this 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 reference but the hardcore that i'm referencing is definitely specifically tailored towards the you know whatever old schoolish hardcore type stuff um and then obviously i do know that you have a very strong affinity for southern california um in regards to uh, a lot of the bands that have been from here so i just didn't yes. know i didn't know that you're i guess you cut your teeth cuz people i find people either kind of their gateway drug into independent music is either, you know, metal or uh -huh. punk slash hardcore. Like those are the, you know, sometimes they're obviously mutually exclusive and you get one person gets into, you know, both at the same time. But um, my own perception was the fact that, Here, you know, here's what, here's what I want your help with. Please. And I've been meaning to do this for like literally years. <laughs> um, and maybe you can, maybe you can help me with it. We should do a, a joint post about it. I want to come up with like, Especially like punk and hardcore bands, because I don't want to write about old metal, or else it will attract the wrong element. Yes. Um, I want to come up with a list of like the definitive entry level bands, and they don't change over the years. Like Misfits, Operation Ivy, Dead Kennedys, Minor Threat. You know, yeah, exactly. They don't change. They were the same when we were thirteen, yep. and they're the same now. You'll still see some. Like angry, burned out little kid wandering around the mall in a Misfits shirt, yeah. and he looks exactly the same as he did in 1990 because sure. it's the same kid. So yeah, I totally agree. There's like for whatever reason, those are like the entry level like gateway bands that people use to get into it. Yeah, and uh, well, that's just how it works. Yeah, it's it's so easy. But um, so no, so you 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 grew up in the Pacific Northwest hardcore scene, so to speak. Like when did you first get exposed to? you know, independent music as it were. Well, the very first show I went to, and I was super young, so I didn't know what, I didn't know what was happening or anything about it was at the very end of 1989, it was uh, a band from uh, Federal Way of Washington called Date Rape, um, Sounds who great. actually, they're actually they're pretty good. I, I still have their demo. It's pretty sweet. I've been meaning to post it for, again, years, but <laughs> Ripping stuff from cassette is a huge pain in the ass, so I never got around to it. Um, but it was a date rape, another band called Dumped, if anyone, D U M T, if anyone from Washington is listening to this, especially if you're from Everett like I am, you'll think it is hilarious that somebody in 2012 was talking about Dumped. Uh, it was Dump, Date Rape, Last Gasp, and Splat in Federal Way, I think. 
I went, like, my dad took me to that, and, uh... And was that just, like, of your own, you were like, dad, take me to this local show, like, I yeah. just need to know I need to be there. Yeah, exactly, like, I, uh, somehow or another, I think I saw on MTV, I remember what it was, I saw Mike Muir from Suicidal Tendencies on MTV talking about how they were banned from playing in LA, this is, like, 89, and I think they're banned from playing there for, like, five years or something like that because of, like, violence at their shows or whatever, um... And he was talking about, you know, being psycho Michael and fighting with your mind instead of your fists and whatever <laughs> he says, you know. And, of course, I thought that was cool. So um, I bought a Suicidal Tendencies tape and a Sex Pistols tape and then went to that show with my dad. Um, so it was pretty cool that my dad took me to that. And then uh, went to other, like, random, like, local hardcore metal shows when I was, like, 12 with my dad. And it was weird. And... <laughs> Dude, your dad, he, your dad is pretty, uh, because you don't typically hear that, even from, like, because uh, hearing the way that you talk, like, you know, we're roughly of the same age and generation, so, like, I, I yeah. know that I could never convince my dad, to, I mean, my dad could maybe drop me off at a show, but, so your dad was pretty down. My dad saw, like, The Accused and The Melvins with me in 1990. Impressive. My dad has, my dad has like, very serious scene credentials. Yes, he does. Maybe I should I'm not be, joking. Maybe, and he used to work. He used to sit next to Buzz Osborne from Melvin's brother at work. Maybe I should be interviewing him instead of you. I, I actually have been meaning to interview him for my podcast because he was also a, a corrections officer for 25 years. So, oh, so he has a lot. Have any stories? Yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about the paperwork for inmate intake. Um, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What? That, uh, that would be what the spiciest. Think, what, which Which is the most time consuming? F- form <laughs> please walk me through it you know step by step how you how you go about uh filling out the classification uh paperwork yeah which would that would make for a very compelling conversation um so so after your dad took you to a few of these shows you pretty much you know like once you started having the ability to transport yourself there did you like pretty much adopt a specific scene at that point like you know as far as like all right i'm you know did you start labeling yourself where it's like all right i'm you know, a straight edge hardcore kid or whatever, or did you kind of just do a lot of sampling? Well, I never really had the ability to transport transport myself because I didn't have my driver's license till I was 21 because I couldn't afford a car or anything like that. So I had to find other ways of getting shows. And it was always a pain in the ass, but I did it. Um, but uh, I've always kind of been the same as I am now, which is that I listen to, you know, everything but i guess mostly like um ignorant hardcore pop punk and rap so you know back then like early 90s i would say that uh you know the there were uh, a bunch of seattle bands that were pretty cool undertow was probably the one that people might know about now yeah um but there were a lot of other bands that were good back well not a lot but there were there were other bands that were good back then that nobody's heard about because back then like Seattle was totally isolated from the rest of the country. And cause this was before, you know, this was maybe Nirvana era, but, um, this is before Seattle was like so much smaller and just not on the map than it was, than it is now. Like this is before Amazon and Microsoft. I mean, Microsoft existed, but it was totally different. And, Nintendo and Starbucks and all that like made it into like Silicon Valley too, which it basically is now. Mm-hmm. So back then bands never played there. Like once in a fucking blue moon, like some victory band would play there and it was like a big event, like literally once every like three to six months or something, like some like you know, national level quote unquote band would play there and it's a big deal. Well I think it's funny because I think though especially at that time in that era, I think bands that did that they wanted to do that because it was like those shows were infinitely better than any of your other, you know, major quote unquote major market shows because they're just like, Oh wow, these kids are starved for music and we play here and we sell a shitload of merch. Kids go off and it's fun. That's probably true. I mean, I didn't in 1992, I didn't, you know, I was 14, so I didn't go to a lot of shows in other parts of the country. Yeah, sure. You know, but (laughs) you weren't weren't touring at 14. Uh, no, I waited till I was 16 or 17 for that. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, people, it was definitely a big deal. Like if any, you know, for whatever reason, like bloodlet 
kind of adopted Seattle and played there a lot, which is weird because they're from Florida. Um, but I think it's because they were like weird, fucked up, reclusive junkies, and there are a lot of those people in Seattle too. I don't know. Yeah, um, they tend to migrate there. They definitely do, like <laughs> my parents, for example. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I guess back then, you know, the in Seattle there was really only like, um, you know, basically like even if the bands weren't straight edge, you know, kind of the like. Uh, you know, like straight edge mosh core kind of style bands were really the only local. There were some like shitty punk bands, but they were so awful that like even fourteen year old me couldn't be bothered with them. Right. Like I, I, I am a dis- I have a discerning taste. I know right. these guys are terrible. This is below even my shockingly low standards. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you saying that um, before before I moved on to some uh, another element of. Uh, Sergeant D has the persona. The the one thing that I find refreshing about obviously the you know the content that you produce and the writing that you do, um, I think a lot of people that as they grow older, they find themselves having to draw these definitive lines in the sand where it's like, all right, I have hit set age. I am no longer allowed to like Blink One Eighty Two. Um, or, Which is uh, funny because that band has been around since 1994, right? <laughs> so, almost 20 years, and and we think of them as newer. No, totally. But it's like I just I see so many people that you know do have these. Like I said, where it's like you know once you hit college age, you're expected to like indie rock if you were right. You know, it, it's those those uh, those you know tent poles where people kind of all right. This now I I, I supposedly have grown up. These like arbitrary gay lines in the sand for people who like have no actual identity and can't think for themselves and are afraid to like do anything that isn't orthodox basically sure no no totally i mean because obviously it's it's easier to it's easier to talk crap about stuff that you were into when you were younger um yeah rather than actually going out on a limb and saying like no i still enjoy this because it you know still pleases this sense of my musical taste so or what seems to be absolutely impossible is recognize that the thing you liked when you were a kid is like actually crap and that there are people who are doing something better than that now. For example, when I was 14 or 16, I somehow convinced myself Discharge was a good band, which <laughs> is absolutely not true. They're terrible. <laughs> like just by any objective standard, they're fucking awful. Um, and... You know, the fact of the matter is that there are, you know, the I liked it. I well, first of all, I pretended to like it. I didn't really. I pretended to like it because that's what all the like crust punks with like cool Butt leather jackets sure. hat, you know, thought was cool. And second, you know, there just weren't any better options. And I have no reason. Like, I don't understand why music is this like special thing where you have to like defend to the death the dumb shit you liked when you were a stupid little kid, you know, and like, it's not that way with TV. Like, you know, nobody gets butt hurt. If you say like, man, have you watched different strokes lately? That show's terrible. I can't believe we liked it. Right. Like, no, I haven't watched it, but totally sure that it is awful. Um, you know, that's like a non-issue, but if you suggest that, I don't know, like fill in the blank fucking, you know, mean season, you know, isn't a, the best fucking classic band of all time, and somebody's gonna run after you with torches and pitchforks. And I don't know why people get so butthurt about music, um, as opposed to any other form of, you know, shitty, like superficial pop culture. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I understand elements of what you're saying. I mean, I, I think obviously, like a band like Mean Season is a very, you know, particular small reference but it's like it, I pick it's, on them all the time so if anybody who was in Mean Season happens to be listening to that I apologize <laughs> it's all in good fun and I'm totally sure that if I was in a band then it would be just as bad as Mean Season so <laughs> no offense Matt <laughs> not, not, none taken whatsoever I have no uh, I, I don't know anybody in Mean Season I knew someone that played drums for them for a show but that is irrelevant but I, I'm specifically interested in the um, how the Sergeant D persona, like, you know, when did you start to develop 
you know, your, I mean, obviously your sense of humor has probably existed since you were, you know, four or five years old, but when did you first start to feel like you were able to develop into, you know, a writer? Like, has that always been something you were interested in? And, you know, how did that kind of combine with your sense of humor? Well, I started doing zines. Um, For anybody under the age of 30 who's listening to this, um, a zine was something that um, was a little magazine that that you made 50 copies of by using the photocopier at your friend's dad's office when he wasn't looking and gave to your friends at shows back before the internet existed. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, or or you went to a Kinko's and tried to steal as many copies as you possibly could before they had right. the copy keys. Yeah, unless you you know knew one of the <laughs> four hundred thousand hardcore kids that worked at Kinko's who would give you copy keys or something like that. Exactly. We had to. Ju- point is, we had to jump through a lot. It's way harder to uh, produce anything physical, whether that's a CD or a piece of paper or something like that, than it is to put things on the internet. Which has good and bad, um, you know, qualities to it. But anyway, so I started doing zines when in like '92, I think, and uh, so I pretty much never stopped either doing zines or, you know, writing shit on the internet since then. And it has basically all been pretty similar. I didn't understand that I liked stuff that you weren't. I didn't understand that uh, I liked combinations and things that weren't um, uh, weren't allowed that you weren't allowed to like until uh, maybe like I don't know ninety six or ninety seven or something because I was really into like uh, all those uh, you know quote unquote power violence bands like uh, Spaz being like you know my favorite band at the time and uh, I have a podcast coming up with Dan from Spaz who I still talk to twenty years later. Nice. Um, but so I was into that stuff, which is, you know, those, these are like, you know, all the, all the people in those bands were like legit fuck, not spaz, but all the other ones were like legit fucked up basement recluse junkies, you know? Yeah. Bar- barely could make it out to play a show. Literally. Yep. Yes. They were like literally basement shut-ins. Um, so I was into that stuff. And, but then I was also into like strung out and lag wagon, you know, and all that stuff. And then also into like, you know, Earth Crisis and Strain and Undertow, and then also into like whatever fucking random like rap or whatever. And I remember specifically, uh, I did the zine for a while, which I don't want to use the name of because it has my real name in it. Okay. <laughs> There's probably people listening to this that have it. Um, but I did the zine, and like I remember mentioning in there that I liked, and I I had gotten to know you remember Maximum Rock and Roll, right? Of course. So I'd gotten to know a couple, you know, made friends with a couple people that um, did reviews for Maximum Rock and Roll, and they always like gave my zine good reviews and stuff, which back in the day m- meant something. Yes. And uh, I remember I was like maybe nineteen or something, so this is I was like twenty, so this is like uh, two thousand. I mean. Uh, <laughs> 2000 it's like 98 99 and i i mentioned something about in my zine how i liked ub40 and uh Ooh, you're, you must have got crucified yes i remember he was like it's pretty cool he interviews like dystopia and apartment 213 and whatever gehenna or whoever else they interviewed it's like but i'm really baffled at when he discusses how much he appreciates Madonna and UB40. I can't tell if he's being sarcastic or if he's just a fucking idiot. <laughs> like, what? That's like incredible. It was like in passing. I mentioned that I like UB40. I'm like, really? You poured over my fucking dumb zine enough to pick up the four words where I mentioned UB40? Yeah, that was like... It, it was like, 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 that you... made your butt hurt that badly? <laughs> So did like as you started to see that obviously there was this dichotomy in the music that you liked like when did you actually adopt Sergeant D as the persona that you you know are you know and you started to obviously publish your stuff online Well I just used that as a fake name but like right. for example that same zine you remember the locust right Of course or as they were called back then locust Well I the, I saw them in 90 <laughs> Four, I think, with Man is the Bastard, when they just dressed like normal, yes, you know, 
kids that wore like sweatshirts and dickies and fucking white t-shirts or whatever you know right normal kids from san diego before well back when people from san diego looked normal right (laughs) but (laughs) anyway uh so in that zine the same one that uh talked about eb40 i i I was i worked at a print shop at the time and so i was printing it and did you ever do a zine i i did i did a i did one zine yes Okay, so you know how the the page count has to be a multiple of four in order for it to like paginate correctly. You yes. know what I mean? Yes, correct. So I realized that I had mistakenly like ended up with thirty one pages instead of thirty two, and I had to print it like that night because that was when the boss was gone or something. Sure. I was like, "Fuck!" Um, so <laughs> I just made a page that said real big. Because I had just seen the locust or something, and I just like fuck, I'll just put whatever in here. I don't care. So I made a page that just said in like seventy-two point type, the bass player for the locust has a fucking beehive, and that put that in there and printed it. And I didn't care, and uh, I didn't really think anything of it. And like to this day, people like still ask me about that because <laughs> he does have a beehive. He had, or did he had like Marge Simpson hair? You know? Sure. Uh. So you can see that's essentially the same thing as what I do now, you know. Right, right. Um, and, and so you started to, yeah, basically you you always developed that sense of humor through your writing, but then you uh, adopted the Sergeant D moniker, like once you started to publish your stuff online, and that medium became more accepted for people to read. Yeah, I just picked I just picked that name, and I regret it now because it has something to do with metal, which I've grown to hate. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm not joking at all about that. Like, I really fucking hate anything that has to do with metal now. That's it's uh, well, you, you. If you lived in the ecosystem for as long as you did with uh, your previous blog, and obviously people uh, gave you feedback on that, then I can easily see why you hate. Well, you work at fucking Century Media. Like, I, how how can you not hate metal? Well, probably because I'm a more positive person than you. But and I'm uh, but most people. I, yeah, no, but I think it's. It, it, I can easily see the amount of negative things that are attached to metal, just because it is such a. Um, it's a very perplexing genre, especially the people that are obviously into it. So fortunately, I didn't have to deal with the quote-unquote general metal public a lot. It was more so just the bands, which obviously is a whole headache in and of itself. But yeah, so I can easily see why you have a very large hatred for metal um and now you know it took me about 10 years to get it um but i finally did specifically like the thing that i didn't understand about metal because you know i, I was like definitely like even though i've always listened to metal well i, I don't really anymore but even though i listened to metal forever mm-hmm. i was always like 100 percent like hardcore like that's like i always went to every hardcore show like every tattoo i have pretty much is like hardcore related like I mean, I'm like a hardcore kid, 100%. Even, even though I like other stuff, you know. Even even your Iron Maiden chess piece. I definitely do not have an Iron Maiden chess piece. <laughs> I have a fucking dis- I have a despise you chess piece. <laughs> You're a winner. <laughs> yes. Uh, I I really do. Um, <clears throat> proud of that one. That's one of my few tattoos that I don't regret and don't think is stupid, and. It's very funny that it, there's like I see little kids on Tumblr now that are like into despise you that are like 16. Yeah, it's a very a very large resurgence with with that sort of genre and specifically despise you as a band. I, how, what do you mean? Like that's of all the bands, like they were maybe w- along with excruciating terror, like the most fucking negative, bleak and no comment, depressing, fucked up band that I could not imagine anybody who was not. A crazy person like me appreciating yeah i i think because of those uh, qualities and i mean obviously angst ridden teenagers like that like we were referencing earlier it's like that's always going to exist so it's like and because despise you can play los angeles and play in front of a lot of um multicultural people you know from white kids to hispanic kids to you know whoever it's like there there's it's rife for the legendary show 
um, talk where it's like, you know, their friend goes to a despise you show one weekend and then they, you know, despise you plays in three months and, you know, he brought his 10 friends or whatever. So I can see it. Really? So kids go like, well, I mean, they didn't play shows until, I mean, they didn't play shows in the nineties or anything. Right. It's, but they do kids, kids go to those shows. Like there's like 16 year olds at those shows now. Yeah. Like when they do, I mean, cause they just play shitholes. It's like, they don't obviously play real venues. They don't go to like chain reaction. They totally play, you know, hole in the wall places. Yeah. Know? They don't go somewhere big like chain reaction. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's obviously like huge plays. That's where um, big bands like fight fair play. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, draw so, upwards of seventy-five people. Yeah, they're, it, that's the big time. Um, but yeah, so it's it, it's interesting and it's definitely um, yeah, it's perplexing. I can't put two and two together why it's happening, but you know, it is in some way, shape, or form. Um, what Chris thinks of that? Yeah, he, I, I know he's stoked. He's stoked that obviously young kids are getting into his stuff because it's better that they get into that than obviously, um, you know, fight fair as you were referencing. Um, something I wanted to, uh, address as well that I found interesting, um, because you obviously, uh, use a lot of inf- what some people would define as inflammatory language <laughs> in regards to, uh, I mean, butt hurt is obviously one of the, uh, more pedestrian terms that you would use, but obviously, you know, you use, use the word gay and, um, you know, there's obviously, uh, it, it's obviously all in good fun from your end of things and you're using it in reference. If anybody thinks, <laughs> here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. So, um, who, fuck, who was it? It was somebody from some fucking stupid band. Um, some fucking dumb nineties band that we totally, that was like, not uh, maybe it was the guy from In My Eyes. I don't remember. It's one of those like okay. '90s bands that I never listened to. Um, but so I wrote that. I, I did a post the other day for anybody who hasn't seen it called "The Day the Scene Went Faggot" about um, hardcore kids, specifically like Unbroken and Undertow, getting into the Smiths back in the '90s. And however, I have no idea how this guy found it. You know, probably put in his Net Zero CD. And, uh, you know, fired up his 56K modem and, uh, you know, looked on, on uh, Alta Vista or Lycos um, for his own name and somehow found it. Sure. Um, but anyhow, so he leaves us butthurt comment about, oh, it's not cool that I said faggot. And by the way, un- Unbroken wasn't the first hardcore band to like the Smiths. And the thing is, like, if you actually think that that post or anything that I write has anything to do with homosexuals rather than, you know, kids trying to experiment with their identity or whatever that post was actually about. Like, I, I, I just don't know what to tell you. Like you have much bigger problems. You know, you have, you have like severe cognitive deficits that will impair your ability to like function as adult in this world if that like sarcasm is not glaringly obvious to you and i i just don't it just doesn't compute to me that like it's so like it's so clear to me that i'm using that term specifically to provoke people like him <laughs> that i it was like baffling to me sure. that anybody could take it seriously yeah no i i, I find it it's like I, I obviously I see uh, I see both sides where it's like I obviously see exactly what you're doing and then obviously I see exactly why a person would read that not know who you are in the you know the context of the right whatever a person just reads the headline and is like holy shit like this dude is a total dickhole. Um, well, these are the same fucking these are the I don't even. I, I, I know you can't put it to words. I understand. No, I can. I just it'll take me so long. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Um, so here, here's all I will say, is that um, I I can't wait until I have kids because um, my kids will be half Asian. My uh, other I have like a bunch of cousins and nieces and nephews that are Mexican, and my uh, other cousin is black. And I have like some gay uncles, so then I'll be able to make all the racist and homophobic jokes I want. Um, and if anybody gets mad about it, um, then I can just be like, uh, I can just pull that card and be like, "Whoa, hey man, 
I'm just joking around with uh, some of the other members of my culture. You need to check yourself, dude. <laughs> you have the ultimate trump card. Exactly. As I'm as I'm stroking my half Asian baby. Like, <laughs> that sounds like a uh, scene out of uh, the first Austin Powers. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so I guess I guess with all that stuff, like um, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this uh, in in the most brief and entertaining way possible. Sure. Um, my whole point with all of that is that um, let's put it this way. So. Um, your best friend that you've known for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, when you guys hang out, you probably spend a lot of time busting each other's balls, right? Of course. That's what friends do. Exactly. So look at something like Chappelle Show or South Park. Um, they're, they're busting each other's balls, and it's because they're friends. You know, right. South Park makes a ton of jokes about... Asian people, like, I don't know if you saw the episode about sushi where the, you know, every Asian person on there is, like, Chinese with, like, you know, the fucking coolie hat, and they're like, oh, hello. Right. You know? Every and, stereotype. Yeah. Trey Parker's wife is from Japan. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that he doesn't hate Asian people. Yeah. You know? Um, so, my whole point with all this, same as when I make fun of bands, same as when I make fun of, you know, any uh, any minority group and by the way, the people that always rush to the defen- to the defense of these minority groups inevitably white heterosexual males, <laughs> because of course these uh, poor minority groups are too oppressed to get butt hurt on their own behalf. So they need uh, well-educated um, white people to rush to their defense. Uh, of course. Well, because they don't. They, the minorities don't have online access, obviously. Well, and they don't know any better either. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, like honestly, this is how these people think. Sure. You know, I'm like, okay, well, you know that, like, you know, I would say probably of like the regular commenters on stuff you'll hate, like, probably least half of them are like, you know, from uh, are either not white, gay, or both, and they seem to be, they seem to think it's pretty funny. Sure. So. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, no, no, no. I just, I, I, I wanted to bring it up because I, I specifically, because obviously it does set people back. Like it even when you were speaking to Todd Jones when you were interviewing Nails, you know, a few episodes ago, where he was totally like, like when he pretty pretended to be offended. Yeah, it was, it was, it was funny. Um, <laughs> when he was like, oh, I should probably pretend like uh, this, for, probably pretend like I don't approve of this language. <laughs> <laughs> um, and. You you also like with the with a lot of the writing that you tackle, you definitely profess a love for a lot of what was happening in Orange County, specifically speaking towards eighteen visions. Like you have you carry a very large, bright burning torch for that band. And you know, where a lot of people now like I mean, a lot of people don't even know who eighteen visions is anymore in general. Um what sad. I yes, and so and that that is a band that um, you know in it as quick as words as you possibly can summarize like why why did you uh why did you and why do you still continue to love that band so much well because they invented about four different subgenres of hardcore for one and two because they had something that kids these days call swagger uh, <laughs> they did and three because they any time that i ran into any of them were really nice friendly people that is that is that is a very good summation i uh, let's put it this way i don't know james hart Mm. met him a few times i don't know him um on a scale of one to ten how much would you say um the hardcore scene is about shit talking currently in this state in this day just in in general in general I don't think it's really changed. Yeah, no, it's probably true. Uh, I'd probably it hover around a, a, a seven, I'd say. Yeah, a lot of shit talking. Yeah. I have never encountered anybody who actually knows James Hart that has ever said anything bad about him. I'm not saying it hasn't happened. I'm just saying I have not, and I've. That's a very rare thing to say. I don't know the guy, but sure. um, I don't know. Yeah. So some. No, I mean that's that's. It's just very. Uh, 
it, it's it's very heartening to obviously hear a person that didn't grow up in the Southern California area that has a very strong opinion <laughs> about about the band because uh, yeah they did you know a lot of the Orange County scene can definitely lend itself to being influenced in some way shape or form by that band. Well, here's the thing. Here, here's here's what I've realized about myself is I really I hate like traditionalism. And I like uh, anything that is modern and and represents a break from the past and doesn't adhere to you know conventions for their own sake. And I would say Eighteen Visions did that like five times. You know, sure. like uh, you know the first EP, it's okay. I mean, it's it is what it is. I, I'm sure that nobody in the band thinks that's their best stuff, which is why they ironically released it as the best of Eighteen Visions. Um, <laughs> Uh, but basically after that, but even then, like that was way heavier than like basically anybody else was doing in hardcore in what, I don't know, was that like 98, 97? Yeah. Like that? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the first LP was like so much more brutal than anything else in hardcore. And a lot of people hated them for various random reasons. Uh, and then they turned into the world's first scene band. Well, I don't know if they were seen when until the ink runs out. They were they were like proto scene. That's when like James started like riding an air Harley on stage. Of course. They were fashion and, core. Yes, and Brandon wore his sleeveless dancing shirt at every single show. Yes. Um you can tell I'm an Agent Vision scholar. I know, which it's it, like I said, it's it's heartening because usually this this uh, historical perspective on Eighteen Visions solely exists within Southern California because you saw every iteration of the band because you had no choice because you saw them like every other week. So it's it, I I appreciate the uh, the knowledge. <laughs> they played Seattle a lot. So. Yes, they did. They did. They went up there. Yeah. And like I said, and this like honestly means a lot to me. I don't, I don't know any of them other than Hav, who I you know like kind of know. Um, but uh, every time I ran into them and talked to them after shows or whatever, they were like extremely super nice. And that's definitely not the case for everybody in a band, especially a band that you know they were considered big at the time. I guess for a hardcore band, it was definitely not the case for everybody. So that counts for a lot in my book. Yeah, that that definitely rubs off. Um, and sort of one last thing about your, you know, musical-ish type stuff, and then we can talk a little bit about your, you know, the other side of your professionalism, as it were. And I guess I use the word professionalism in quotes because I don't think you view yourself as a professional, except maybe in your professional life. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I do the, uh... Prosumer. Yes, prosumer. Good. I like that. Um... You also definitely have a knack for uh, naming genres of music, such as I'll I'll cite my personal favorite, which is Chain Reaction Core. Mm-hmm. Um, well, when when I said when if some what, the first time you saw the phrase Chain Reaction Core, what came to mind? Yeah, well, I mean everything that uh, that was exactly my late teenage years, like <laughs> the so anything involving Keith Barney and anything involving hardcore. Because it's yeah, it, that that venue was so uh, iconic for Southern California. Now, obviously, it's iconic around the country. Um, but yeah, you know what I just found out that made me really sad hmm. is that Excessive Force never played Chain Reaction. Oh no no no! Because a little here's some some knowledge for you. They played Showcase, right? Uh, yes, Excessive Force yeah. definitely did. But because that's obviously closer to Riverside. Yeah, Excessive Force was long broken up by the time that. Well, because did you know Chain Reaction was originally called Public Storage? No. So here's a little known fact for you. So uh, I, I'm fairly certain that still to this day they actually have in the tiles, like on the ground, when you walk into Chain Reaction, they have a giant PS because it was originally meant to be like a coffee shop slash venue. Um, I definitely had the displeasure of playing there when it was called Public Storage. Um, because, I mean, they were just obviously looking for any band, so it's like my first shitty band could play there. And they left all, like, I mean, you've been to Chain Reaction, so you know what the floor is set up like now. So where all the kids go to pit and sing along and whatever, uh, that's where it Or as as they call now, hardcore dance? Exactly, when they want to hardcore dance. Um, When when their parents let them out and they want to hardcore dance. Um that's where tables were set up. So it's like people would be having fucking their 
you know, latte, trying to, like, to have a conversation with their friend, and there's a loud band playing. Like, you know, it's one it's one thing if there's, like, an acoustic act, but there's bands, like, you know, we, I saw Indecision there, and it was like, what the fuck are they doing? Like, this was one of the worst ideas ever, but then I obviously got new ownership and then was able to live through that, but it was, uh, yeah, that's a little tidbit for you to know and carry on to the future and build well, your uh, Chain Reaction Core book. Outside of, because obviously you've done all of this writing as a, uh, as a quote-unquote hobby, it, it hasn't paid the bills, so to speak. Artist, I prefer to say artist. Artist, that's true. Yeah, you're a freelance artist. There we go. Um, I don't try to label things, so if you want to call it freelance, that's fine. You know, I, I leave it to the audience to choose how to interpret my work. I love the fact that you just said you don't label things. <laughs> just, you know, yeah, it's... You know, I'm just past that. If people want to label it, you know, that's fine. Um, it, you know, we we try to leave things. I mean, I try to leave things open ended so people can interpret it for themselves. Yeah, and that honestly, that's a sign of a true artist. I totally respect that. Yeah. This is this is what every band who um, releases their boring, shitty album that nobody likes says. Usually, the sophomore record for sure. Yeah. Um, or the, like the fifth one when they're <laughs> just out of ideas and they're over it and. They have to fulfill their contract and blah, blah, blah. Right, exactly. Um, you've you've personally had a lot of experience within sort of the the corporate world, and I find that really interesting. Um, not only just like as an entity, but obviously at some point, you know, when you're 16 or 17 years old, the hardcore kid and everybody is like, you know, fuck the system, burn it down. I want to live on a commune, and you know, to some degree. Um, but then obviously you grow up and you're like, oh, I need to earn money somehow. Um, and, you know, some kids, they sign up for some, you know, soul-sucking job. Not to say that the ones that you had were soul-sucking. I'm not going to assume. Hey, all, all jobs are soul-sucking. Like, you, you've been on tour. Like, sure. yeah, did it true. not fucking suck your goddamn soul out your asshole? There, there were certain times where my asshole was definitely sucked out. And, Here's the thing. Yeah. Every job eventually is boring bullshit that you don't want to do and that's why they have to pay you to be there right they're they're paying for your services exactly that's why you wouldn't do it for free that's why they call it work and that's why they have to pay you to be there right like think of like this is like that's like the ultimate standard for stuff you don't want to do it's like oh man you know you you, you'd have to you'd have to pay me a lot of money to do such and such oh what about uh seventy two thousand dollars a year Mm, yeah yeah no uh yeah, I think I think that would be enough. Do I get let's, benefits? Uh, let's do, I get do it. Benefits? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I find it interesting. Or the one thing that I find the most interesting is people that do, you know, exist in the quote unquote real world, uh, the normals, as I like to call them. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but they've, you know, they've come from the same backgrounds that you know people like you and I have. But then all of a sudden, because there's this, you know, arbitrary line in the sand where it's like, all right, you got to drop that kid shit. Like, you can't be, you know, into this type of stuff anymore because you won't have anything to talk about around the water cooler. Um, yeah. You know, how have you personally sort of, how's that experience in the corporate world navigated kind of, you know, who you are? And have has, have people, like, once you've revealed certain aspects about your life to them, have people been kind of like, whoa, you're into some crazy shit? Um. Well, I guess I would say two things. First is that these days, like, it's not, like, we're in our 30s. Like, we're not special fucking snowflakes. There are, like, zillions of people like us who listen to hardcore or whatever at some point and still do that have, like, respectable jobs. Happens all the time. Like, my old boss at my last job, like, the way that we ended up, like, you know, hitting it off was, like, I was, like, my first or second week there, and I had a Cox Bar patch on my, or not patch, a pin on my bag and he used to be a skinhead and uh he was like oh you like cox bar man they're sweet i used to love blitz and agnostic front and rah 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 you know and then we were buddies and he was like the vice president of the company you know yeah and uh you know people i work with now like the first day like i sat down at the job kid next to me well kid he's like my age the dude next to me was wearing a breakdown shirt and listening to bulldoze you know and i didn't know who the fuck he was <laughs> You know, right? No, um, I, so I, I guess I, I think I mean sorry, you know it's okay. I th I think you're right. Just just to that point, I think you're right. Obviously, it's like it's become more mainstream, and it's not as like 
strange to find people that are into, you know, whatever. You wouldn't be shocked if a kid sat next to you and was into acacia strain. It's more shocking to have a person sit next to you and obviously be into bulldoze and breakdown. Like, that's, like, a further of a stretch. Kind of, but, like, I guess think about who was into hardcore, like, you know, in the 90s. Like, maybe maybe kids were weird, but definitely, like, almost all smart and, like, you wouldn't be into hardcore unless you're really passionate about it because it's really hard to find out about it in the first place. So, um, especially to, like travel all over the fucking country or whatever and like track down random seven inches. Like, sure. For example, like I know like five people who had the Bludgeon seven inch. If you know who that is, it was like a pre fall silent band. I know five people who had the Bludgeon seven inch, and there were 250 of those made. Right. You know, so like how like committed to this thing would you have to be to like acquire the Bludgeon seven inch? You know, pretty committed. So I would say that I don't, in retrospect, I really don't think it's surprising that people who were really smart and very passionate about what they're into ended up having successful careers because that's what makes people successful is a combination of those two things. Um, and second that, you know, I, I mean, I don't, you know, I'm, although I write about music and random shit, you know, that's not all I'm into. So not like, uh, you know, I'm not like a, a, a one-note personality where all I can talk about is the acacia strain. You know, I'm into a lot of other random shit, and uh, you know, I've especially like, you know, I don't want to be that guy that like, oh, careful, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to go too close to his desk or I'll talk your ear off about fucking icy stars. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if someone actually said that, I would pay money. That would be spectacular. Oh, well, I specifically mentioned that because I work with a guy who is 29 years old and will fucking talk your, ears about, talk your ear off about icy stars. And uh, my friend Sean, who writes her stuff you'll hate, he uh, goes by Sean you'll hate, uh, who used to work with me, doesn't anymore. He's like, dude, do you, do you ever talk to Rocky? And I'm like, ah, I try not to. He's like, Dude, why does he fucking always like? Does he ask you about icy stars every time you see him? Like, yeah, icy stars, Memphis May Fire, whatever, you know, like whatever three, uh, three word band name there. Yeah, like he's into all these fucking rise core bands, and he is like twenty nine years old, which is cool. But uh, like, I, I specifically sometimes walk a specific route in work at work to avoid talking to him because I don't want him to be like. Oh hey, did you see that new uh, video? Like that new plot and you song on their Facebook? It's so sweet, dude. Like that breakdown is so hard. I'm like, I'm sure it is. Um, just you know, I have really honestly like haven't gotten around to listening to it. You know, so <laughs> so he's so he by uh, my personal standards would be defined as a punisher. So a person that obviously <laughs> yeah okay. Just want to make want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. He is the definition of a Punisher. <laughs> Great guy. Um, but I don't want to be a Punisher. Sure. And uh, I have been in the past, probably still am sometimes in the present, but I try very hard not to be. So, um, you know, uh, I can talk about and, you know, I I don't talk about fucking, you know, yeah. fill in the blank, random, stupid, shitty, funny internet bullshit with normal people because... That's weird. Yeah, no, yeah. You you gotta have uh, normal conversations with people. You don't try to wedge your own interests that they clearly have no concept of where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah, like uh, be yeah. like, so uh, how are things in your department of the company? Hmm, that's very interesting. Have you uh, been following the latest developments and current events? Yes, uh, so have I. What do you think about the prospects for the local sports team this season? <laughs> Exactly. What do you What do you think about that? Out, that's outrageous. Losing two band members. Wait, what? What'd you say? I don't understand. Uh, have you heard any interesting gossip about our, any of our coworkers? <laughs> That'd be per. That's like a really good script. You should probably uh, like post that as a PDF on iTunes, and people could probably you know you can make a little money off that. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm afraid of. Uh, you know, I try to hold my cards pretty closely to my chest when it comes to, uh, you know, my intellectual property. Um, you know, no offense. I appreciate the idea, but... Uh, I understand. I don't there's, want a to... lot of, there's a lot of people in the entertainment industry that, to be frank, uh, you know, just aren't trustworthy. 
No, I understand. I don't, I don't want to give you ideas on how to make money. Um, and sort of, I, I, yeah, I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of Jewish friends, so, you know, I'm, <laughs> you're fine. You're taken care of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and sort of to, uh, wrap things up with the idea of, you know, you've obviously, like I referenced a few times that you've started a podcast that's splintered off from stuff you will hate. Um, and it's basically a, a an audio version of obviously what is contained on the site, uh, you know, focusing on interviews and, um, I do admire the obviously the wide spectrum that you can cover with you know old obscure hardcore bands and then obviously um, you know Anthony Green and the most recent one because um, I do believe he's pretty, he's pretty old too, dude. He's like no, twenty eight no, no. or something. Yeah. You know, yeah, no, he's he's older age wise, yeah. but obviously it's like he travels in a very different scene. Yeah, um, but uh, it's yes. probably a bad idea for things to be that scattered. But I just talk to people. I try to talk to people that I know um, and I guess I just know a lot of random people so um, that's just kind of the way it works out and it'd probably be better for me to be more focused about it but anyway what were you going to ask? No, no, no I I, I, th- I think that's charming because that's, that's personally what I like to do as well because I mean the people that will appear in this podcast definitely are from all corners of in the independent music world, but why did you feel the you know the the need to kind of you know splinter that off and be like, hey, I I need to do a podcast and this is how I'm going to accomplish this. Uh, I really don't remember to be honest. Um, I don't remember what specifically. Did um, you, but did you feel you were like, yo, I gotta, I would love to do a podcast about this well, or no, I really don't remember how I came up with it. Um, I, that's a good question. I, I totally forget. Um, one, one thing is that sometimes when you take a lot of stimulants, you come up with ideas and maybe do things with them and don't remember what happened. So, um, I hope stimulants, you mean like uh, adrenaline shots directly to the heart, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I really, I don't remember. I, I, I really, I know I'd mentioned it before and I know at some point I was like, dude, we should do this podcast and I don't remember why, but, um, <laughs> it just but, needs to exist. No, there was a reason and I don't remember. I would have to, I would have to look through some text messages to Sean <laughs> to find, so I don't know. Uh, no, but I was, okay. I was definitely high when I thought of it for sure. And I don't know why. Um, but uh, basically, I really don't listen to music that much. I listen to comedy podcasts probably 90% of the time, unless like anything I make fun of on the website, I probably listen to once or maybe not even all the way through. Maybe listen to like 45 seconds or something of, of it. Just enough more. to get a taste. Yeah, I mean, you know how it is. Like, if you've been listening to this stuff long enough, like, you know, you like, okay, I see where you're headed with this. I get it. I know enough to make fun of you. Um, but with, uh, with the podcast or with podcasts in general, like I, I listen to like Adam Carolla, Joe Rogan, the champs, um, a couple of MMA ones, a couple of steroid ones. Um, please, please, and, please reference a couple of steroid ones. I do not know what that means. Oh, there's one. Uh, Superhuman Radio is one. It's kind of crappy, though. I only listen if they have a good guest because I really don't like the main host. So they're just, um, they, they basically just speak about uh, HGH and how you can be stronger with the use of chemicals? Yeah, okay. it, pretty much. I mean, I okay. could... Uh, if, anybody, if, anybody who, uh, if anybody is an anabolic steroid user, then uh, they'll, uh, who's listening, they'll, they'll, they'll like my joke, uh, someone set us up the trend bomb. <laughs> Wow, that that is a, that that is a world I I know nothing about. So I'll pretend to laugh in my head. Yeah, well, uh, trend bomb. It's uh anyway. <laughs> anyway, everybody knows. Uh, anyway, so yeah, that's pretty much what I listen to is like comedy podcasts. Um, and they're a pretty big deal. Like uh, Adam Carolla is the most popular podcast in the whole world. You know, mm-hmm. and people. You know, I used to love Love Line. That's Loveline is basically like my favorite thing in the world, so I love his podcast also, and uh, I love Joe Rogan's. Although maybe I'm, I might be falling out of love with Joe Rogan's podcast because he gets a lot into uh, like hippie stoner talk about aliens and 
the moon landing being faked. Let me speaking of the moon landing. Um, you know, one of the the main pieces of evidence that like uh, moon landing debunkers, quote unquote, gave is like, if we landed on the moon, how come we haven't been back, huh? Uh, did you know we've been there six times? Yeah, there's 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 uh, some, there's some proof. Oh, we have. <laughs> yeah, six times been in orbit. A couple times there's been like fifteen Apollo missions. Oh. Uh, well. Yeah, I don't know, man. It just it seems like bogus. <laughs> uh, so, Joe Rogan, I don't know. Uh, like his stand-up podcast, might be falling out of love with it. The Champs, like like we talked about before we did this, you know, it's kind of my template for really what I wish uh, podcast would be. And they they seem like just uh, podcasts are a big deal now, and I think it's exciting. And uh, so now it might be too now random. It's, now it's so. time for you to cash in. So I totally get it. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you obviously you 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 want to you know quit uh, working in corporate worlds and uh, and then obviously just make millions off of a podcast. So I get I mean, it. We have tens of listeners worldwide. Which, as long as it's worldwide, as long as you can say it's worldwide and you have tens, like who knows where that is? Yeah, exactly. You could um, be reaching a demographic that's very valuable. Could be some of the most authentic users in the world, and you can't put a price on that. That's spectacular. Well, uh, I do appreciate you hanging out and bullshitting, and um, yeah, it was uh, very enjoyable. I hope it was for you as well. Cool. Well, appreciate uh, appreciate you having me on. Yeah.